hate you both. I've hated you ever since I can remember. I hate you, and I wish you both had cancer. Cancer? Yes, in the head. <gasps> I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain! Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? This is the stupid answer. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> People seem to like me because I am polite and I'm rarely late. Don't worry, I got an idea. And now, the host of the Stupid Cancer Show, Matthew Sack. Woohoo! Not that there's anything wrong with him. Because he has a lot of chit spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello and welcome to episode 375 of the Stupid Cancer Show, the voice of young adult cancer. I'm your host, Matthew Zachary, a proud 20-year young adult brain cancer survivor, coming to you now from the Chemo Deck, our fabulous studio in downtown Manhattan. Broadcasting since 2007, the Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing Young Enough Cancer online at stupidcancer.org. My fabulous co-founder, Kenny Kane, away on vacation. Yes, we allow our employees to take vacation. If he were here, he would say that we welcome all of our first-time and returning listeners and to never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. All right, it's not okay that 72,000 young adults are diagnosed with cancer each and every year, so got cancer under 40 sucks, huh? Time to get busy living, folks, because the stupid cancer show is changing the world one chemo infusion at a time. But a great show, Full House tonight, the Orange Giraffe Project works in partnership with New York City-based hospitals, museums, art centers, and jewelry designers to provide cancer patients and their families uh, the opportunity to create personalized jewelry. We're joined by Maggie Chang, the founder and president, Stephanie Sheldon, an artist, Jen Brown, who I apparently know, a young adult survivor here, and uh, we're going to discuss the charity's mission to empower those in need in the Survivor Spotlight on Jackie Duvall Smith. It's going to be a really, really great show, and we are actually staffless. Oh, Mallory and I are staffless. I'm, I'm the sole remaining we're missing, staff member. We're missing Kenny and Sean and Noel. Yes. Oh. Yes. It is just... Uh, what was the last time... Have we ever done a show without anyone else in, like, your two years here? I'm not entirely sure. Not a full show. Okay. May, maybe a segment here and there, right. but not a full show. This this it's, is the first time. All right. Well, there's the supposedly first time for everything. <laughs> Apparently. Yes. How are you? I am just dandy. That's your best. That's it, your best. It is my go-to saying. Yeah. So, you know, good times. And you're Can't not complain. taking the seven anymore, which is even better, right? The L. The L, sorry. The L and I are no longer friends. Okay. The A train and I are besties. Good. That's a good thing. It's good times. I get here and I get here on time. Yes. So we got some some good news here at the top of the show. We are going to uh, proudly announce tonight here live. Yay. You heard it first. Andrew McMahon of uh, some of the corporate Jack's mannequin, young adult survivor extraordinaire, and recipient of our what did he get in 2014 Impact Social Impact Award. Yes, he received the Social Impact Award. Is coming to Denver for CancerCon 2016 and giving us a live performance i personally am so excited i could jump and dance for joy because he is amazing on every front he also has a really cool organization called dear jack foundation yes and dear jack foundation is going to be formally partnering with super cancer to develop more i would say enhanced meetups yes. around the country involving yoga and wellness and nutrition and mindfulness all potential fun things happening great things great but i'm things. very excited that he's going to be in Denver. Andrew told me he wants to tap my brain, which I told him is a dangerous rabbit hole to never go down. Oh, boy. He wants to learn all about nonprofits and politics and who you know. And so we'll see when his head explodes. He doesn't know what he just signed himself no, up for. We're, we're going to lay odds. We're going to put out the, <laughs> the gonna, after two weeks, three weeks, whatever the pool is going to be, the, the option pool. Yeah. 
Um, Toast Denver coming. We are bringing Toast, an evening with stupid cancer, our fabulous fundraiser to Denver. And it is happening. Dates. I should really know these things in advance April of the show. April 7th. There you go. Thank you. April 7th at the Art Hotel in Denver. Uh, tickets on sale now. Sponsorships available at toast.stupidcancer.org. Uh, we are going to be uh, teasing the road trip. We have formally uh, figured out the route, the vehicle, the sponsors, and the destinations, and the stakeholders, and the survivors. And it's going to be amazing. And we will be launching stupidcancerroadtrip.org probably next week. Yes. All that fun, exciting 14 stuff. 14 cities, 14 days. A couple of surprises here and there. Lots of Kenny in a car. Lots of Kenny in the car. Exactly. Um, and, of course, going back to CancerCon, we're pretty much sold out. We have maybe 30 or 40 spots left. We do not have a lot of spots left, and those are going to go very quickly. Now that Andrew's being billed. Now that Andrew's going to be showing up, who knows how f- quickly those spots are going to go. Jen's nodding over there. I got to go to Denver. <laughs> got to go to Denver. I mean, there's also some really other fun items happening at CancerCon, like all of the extra tours you can sign up for. I think the tours are the coolest thing. They are really cool. And this year there is a tour to uh, Red Rocks that also includes a VIP club tour. VIP, oh, a VIP club. VIP tour of the Coors Brewery. Wow. And we're going back to the Rockies game. That's amazing. So a lot of fun stuff happening. Good stuff. Good stuff. And finally, I will be dropping my U.S. Newsweek article tomorrow uh, called The Cure Isn't Enough. And we can discuss that tonight because we're all about survivorship, quality of life. And and I'm so uh, emphatic about how research is just a part of the cure and what we need to survive and get busy living matters the most. So with that said, uh, I would like to formally introduce our survivor spotlight. If you can guess what movie this song is from, you win a prize. Jackie Duvall Smith is a breast cancer survivor, mother, and artist. Jackie has shown her work in Minneapolis, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. One of them is not like the other. <laughs> Where she placed first in the 2011 creative competition for jewelry design, sponsored by our friends here tonight at the Orange Giraffe Project. Please welcome, right here, live in studio, Jackie Duvall Smith. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here. Can you name that tune? I know the tune. I don't know who sings it or did you say it was from a movie? It's from a movie. Well, it's from a movie soundtrack. I'm going to say something totally inappropriate. Cheech and Chong. Uh, I will tell you only one guest has gotten it right in nine years. Really? Yeah. Is it? Wait, Jen, do you know? Do you really know? No, close. Very close. She said Pulp Fiction. Very, very (laughs) close. It's uh, Elmore Leonard from... Get Shorty. Oh, Get Shorty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just, now everyone's going to know the answer now, so it's not going to be a fun question anymore. I have to play the, all the other tracks going forward. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for coming here live. We love oh, guests you. that don't call in. I mean, we love guests that do call in, but it's just so much. I just ruined everything. <laughs> guests it's, that call in are great, but yeah. guests that are here are even better. Yes, there we go. Because eye contact is something I'm teaching my five-year-olds, and it's so important. I know how that is. I have two kids. Yes. Uh, do they make eye contact? Um, not when they're in trouble. My older son today would not talk to me about homework. Oh, uh, okay. No. Nope. Oh, got homework. <laughs> would not look me in the eye. We could probably swap lots of stories over wine. I am sure. How old are your kids? Uh, the oldest is 14. The youngest is 10. Okay. I've got five-year-olds, twins. So. Oh, twins. Just tell me I'm in store for, and I'll wait for that it's moment. It's all yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you define fun. So I'm reading here, you were diagnosed six years ago. Six years. Congratulations. Six years That's a six-year cancer anniversary. We like those numbers. Thank you so much. So you had a mammography. I had my first one, and I went in, oh, just dressed for the day yeah and they saw me and they kept calling me back and i'm just like la 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 because i had no idea and all the other people in the waiting room were looking at me funny and it took me a while to realize they were calling me back and back into the room for a reason so i was pretty much diagnosed that day so you are like the poster child for early detection (laughs) Yeah, yes, definitely. But um, all the doctors thought I should have known earlier, but I didn't see anything, feel anything. Isn't that great when they shame you that way? Yeah, yeah, kind of ticked me off. Yeah, (laughs) nothing like bedside manner. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> How old were you? Um, I was 45 at the time. So it was that, I don't know what the rules were six years ago. Was screening 50 back then or was screening 40 and you waited or you uh, weren't, it wasn't a thing? My doctor told me I should start at 45, which is what I did. Um, but a lot of people didn't start until 50. Okay. I mean, so, there's this raging debate over 40 or 50. Yes. You know, we, we represent, I mean, in this case, women larger than 40 for whom mammograms don't matter because right. breast breast tissue and, you know, premenopausal and all that stuff. I mean, I, I don't know. At 45, they found something, which they, is great. They found a lot. And I was considered young. Um, no history of breast cancer in my family besides my great-grandmother, who was like 92 when she got it. So I never even thought about it before. Right. I was so shocked. Right. And you were they found her, too. Was yes. your Yeah. Which We're, is better than BRCA. I mean, we have all these discussions about BRCA yes. and hereditary risk and how in, insanely challenging that diagnosis can be. Yes. You know, we, we, there's no good cancer, but right. it's good that it wasn't BRCA. And HER2 now is actually a good thing because there is medication that can treat it very effectively. But 15 years ago, it would have been a very scary diagnosis no clearly clearly so six years ago your kids were a lot younger oh yes my uh younger son was three i guess and whatever Four? 14 minus six is yeah but eight i can't add. i don't know I'm, math. <laughs> <Does someone> know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a thumbs up that my math is correct <laughs> so it was really hard on them um my younger son i started crying and at one point he said Mommy, I'm going to make you sleep in a crib because you're crying like a little baby. <laughs> wow. But he just didn't understand, really, at that point, what I mean, was happening. This is just so consummate in terms of, I, I meet a lot of people all the time, they're like, well, why young adult cancer? Why do you use those two words? You know, everyone thinks babies and old people. And, well, mm -hmm. young adult cancer matters for several reasons. And it's a little different to get cancer when you're not a baby or 80. Oh, really? Tell mm -hmm. me how. Well... We have ovaries and testis, testicles, you know, and th those, those matter in these years. And you can either have a kid or want to have a kid. And that's what clearly is the defining line in the sand as to why we're different. Right. So were you offered or did you find or were you hysterically searching Google for what do I tell my kids? Um, I th It was really difficult. I did have some books that people had given to me, which were very helpful and my thought was just to tell them everything. And whatever they didn't understand, they could ask as time went on. And our older son had a sense of what was happening. Um, but my sister was mad at me because I called her up that day on the phone. I have cancer. I have cancer. And she was like, don't ever do that to me again. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, as time has gone on, the younger one has really... He figured out what happened and you know has a a good understanding. They both go to Camp Kesem every year, which is love a camp, camp for Kesem. kids affected by cancer. We promote that all the time. We it's, it's, love it's, it. We need people to know more about <laughs> yes, this. It's one yes. of the least well marketed resources for kids whose it, parents are sick. It's wonderful. It's free. Our kids. It's the highlight of their year. They love going to Camp Kesem. The counselors are volunteer college students. They're Beautiful people, very dedicated. I can't say enough good things about Camp Kism. Were you working at the time? I was. And I had to stop working because I was always at the doctor between uh, chemo and then radiation. And then I developed lymphedema. So I was going to a physical therapist three times a week. And I was working freelance at the time. I had no time to right. work. And so... I was very fortunate I applied for Social Security, and they gave it to me. Wow, okay. Which is highly unusual. Well, we, the, uh, did the Freelancers Union exist back then? It did, but I was not a part of okay. it. Okay, because they've, they've come a long way in the yeah. past couple of years about, about how like, you can get FMLA now in the Freelance Union, which is a big deal. Yeah, which is, and at the time, I don't think it was as big right. as it is now. So let's talk more about your life. Because okay. we don't really talk about cure. We talk about what right. does it mean to be alive today. Yes. And I, I don't use the word journey, but you've clearly been through the ringer. Double yes. mastectomy is nothing to, you know, be shy about. 
That's a right. really big change in your life. Yes. <laughs> um, were you, uh, so there's, in 2010, was that law in place where you get reconstruction for free yet? It was pretty new. And at the time, I was pretty much an advocate for myself. And I had hit a roadblock with one thing I don't remember now what it was. But I had to call my insurance company and say, look, I ha- there's a law that says I can do this. So, you know, you need to have it go through. And, yeah, you have to advocate Um, Maybe not as much now, but at the time you had to advocate. You know who was responsible for it? It's called the Early Act. Right. And it was weaved into the Affordable Care Act about a year after it passed when everything was still, uh, the the Congress was largely still Democratic. Right. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a Ah. a fellow young breast cancer survivor herself, pushed this through and it guarantees free reconstruction for life for any Mm -hmm. woman diagnosed with breast cancer. Yep. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really big deal. But I have to say, um, what was interesting is being on Social Security, I did not have health insurance for two years. And my doctors, God bless them, saw me for free for two years. That is, wow. Because I had no other options. That's incredible. It is really incredible. Were you treated here in the city? Yes, at St. Luke's Roosevelt. Well, the the a four no before yeah, yeah. the previous <laughs> previous no previously known as St. Louis yeah Roosevelt. exactly yeah. <laughs> I remember like it was just like Columbia and then New York Presbyterian and then like now that it's all like one giant yes yeah <laughs> it's like how like Citibank actually owns like Santander and Valley National and H they're all in one bank yeah yeah yep. <laughs> well that's good I mean th- these are really amazing things uh, partner spouse siblings anyone in the family during this journey with you oh yeah my husband and my kids were with me my sister came to stay with me uh i went to stay with my family for my last chemo treatment which was the only one that knocked me on my butt um and i was you remember the drugs what were you on they yeah, you? um, <laughs> I have to sing it in song. I know them, right? Right, right. Uh, Herceptin, the T and the C, which ones I, I can't even pronounce. Okay, T, C, lots and of H. syllables. Yeah. Yes, and um, it wasn't until my last one, my uh, white blood cells went down to zero, and I did not move from the couch for three days. So, wow. my family watched the kids. Uh, I tried walking to the end of the driveway and couldn't make it and went back to the couch. Wow. But then I was done and, you know, I moved on to radiation. (laughs) The fabulous radiation. Radiation, my body handled it very well. Really? I was very, very fortunate. That's, I mean, again, it goes back to everyone tolerates things very differently. Yes. Did you have to like live on antiemetics or tell me you didn't even need them? No, I had a little bit of burning on my skin, but I used some natural products my sister gave me, and it took it right away, and I had no other problems. Right. Yeah. So I want to talk about caregivers, because what what I've learned, not that I didn't know this, but what I've found really interesting over the last nine years is how stupid cancer has really become a community that caregivers can associate with, where we're very open about we're not just about the person diagnosed. Everyone says cancer is a family disease. But it really matters that we recognize the caregivers in our lives who sacrifice everything. Definitely. And a third of our content, a third of our social posts, a third of our workshops at our events are all for caregivers specifically. Right. Are you able to speak on behalf of your husband about his burden and how he got through it? Oh, yes. It was very hard for him emotionally. Um, We had a lot of struggles just getting through it together. But he was there for me. Every step of the way, he did a lot of things um, and had the kids help me. I think the hardest part was financially that I was not able to work. And so he had to support the family financially. He had to worry about me. He had to worry about the bills. He had to worry about getting the kids back and forth. There was just a lot for him to have to worry about. I know it was very stressful for him. Sure. And, you know, honestly, there are not a lot of resources out there for people who just need to be able to buy groceries, pay the rent. Um, Those were things that were very difficult for us and caused a lot of stress. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Uh, Before we get to how you got connected to to this bunch, (laughs) um, (laughs) I heard you mention some natural therapies. We we do a lot of of, um, shows and broadcasts about 
the world outside the world that we're we're pushed to do X, Y, and Z, and right. and and there really is a legitimate scientific base for all the other stuff that we don't really talk about that you can only find at Whole Foods or the crazy store on Third Avenue. You I know? agree. <laughs> yeah. um, what has been? I mean, were you? I presume you were you were reasonably healthy when you were diagnosed. Reasonably, yeah. Smoke. Uh, many years ago. Oh, okay. well, that's fine. Drink? Yeah, a little. Perfect. No, wine. I, I wanted a yes. Wine, <laughs> wine is good. Every other week, wine is good and bad for you. So whatever week I it was for you. I stick with it's good for me. Yeah. It's always good for you. It takes and, away my stress. And now chocolate <laughs> cures stroke or something. Yeah, like Every week, works it's, for me. eggs are bad this week. Milk's good next week. It's You never Just know. Just as long as right. a glass of wine remains the equivalent of going to the gym for an hour. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're good. That was it. The glass of wine is a, is a downward to the gym. It, I tell you, it's my greatest stress reaction. Lever. And I think my the worst thing for me was the stress. Before I was diagnosed, I was under a great deal of stress. And I feel like that led to me getting sick. I don't it's not scientific, but I I think stress was. But that speaks to exactly what this is all about, is right. that your mental health, which yes. is an all encompassing thing, factors into everything right. that you have no control over. It controls your immune system. It controls your autoimmune yes. response. It, yes. it, it, and it also affects how well you heal right. once you're sick, which is the perfect segue into how you got connected with the uh, Orange Giraffe Project. Okay, so um, I I used a term earlier tonight, which I, I'm going to use again. In I know I am this, on the survivor spotlight, but um, I like to think of it as no longer being cancer girl. And that was kind of my journey is how do I find myself again? I'm no longer working. I am an artist. I went to school for fine arts. What can I do? And when I was getting chemo, I think it was Golly who came in and um, I could make some jewelry while I was undergoing chemo. The kids were there. They were making jewelry. And it was very good for me because I felt a connection with my creative background and it really took away a lot of my stress and got my mind off of things. And so um, Golly told me about... Um, and who is Golly? She was one of the people working with a creative center. Okay. Which is a organization that does all sorts of art and creativity for Oh, I know them. They're survivors. on like uh, the West Side in like 20, the, 26th Street or something. Right at the Y. Yes, yep. yes, yep. yes. So I went in for a couple of classes and then I signed up for the jewelry class. I had never made jewelry before, and um, I was connected with another artist, and we designed a necklace, and what was the best thing for me was trying to be an artist again, not just create, you know, as a craft, but be an artist, and the artist that worked with me was a jewelry artist, and she got me, and she knew what I was trying to do, and we made my first story necklace. And what it was is that I took a bunch of pieces together that had a history and I put a story into it um, by wrapping words stamped into metal around the necklace. And so for me, it was like uh, it was something you wear, but it was also a story and a piece of art. And what was so great is after this, um, I started making jewelry on my own and I entered a contest for the orange giraffe and I took first place which was absolutely thrilling for me but it also kind of you know made me feel like okay I am still an artist I'm not just cancer girl I'm still an artist and that was a big thing for me so now I make jewelry and I have a studio in Brooklyn and it really it transformed my life it's it's an amazing story and paying it forward too yeah. Have definitely. you found that other cancer patients and survivors are discovering your work? Um, I need to promote my work more. <laughs> You're on the stupid cancer show. I know. <laughs> What's your website? My web <laughs> My website is storynecklace.com. Now, I am not good with websites. I need to put a shopping cart on there, but I'm working on it. Okay. But I am constantly making different piece pieces. I also am having an open studio. Um, at the end of April, which I will post on my website all the details, and I will have my jewelry there. It's in Brooklyn, so if anybody wants to come, it would be great to have you. No, that's wonderful. I mean, again, it's we, we like obviously we have happy endings, and and you're you're here, and and your family's yeah. great, and and you're doing good <laughs> things. 
What would be um, your message to other people who are going through this? And whether they have kids or not, you know, I always ask this question of our of our anyone on our show because the answer is right. always different, but it's very unique and important. Um, it's really hard to say. I, I think that the one thing that I learned from having cancer that, you know, you have to look for something positive that came comes out of it. And a lot of positive things did come out of it. But I really learned to let go. And I think my moment of learning to let go is really what allowed me to find ways to not live under stress. And I, since I believe that stress is bad for your immune system, I think that everybody needs to find their place where they can let go, whether it's financially, relationships. You have to find a way to move into a more healthy lifestyle for you emotionally. I think it's just so important to find that. Well, uh, incredibly inspiring story. Six years cancer-free. Six years. Jackie Duvall-Smith, thank you for joining us on the Stupid Cancer Show. Thank you very much. (laughs) All right, Mal. And now... The news. Hello, I'm Kent Brockman, and this is I on Cancer. Just the facts, ma'am. Head on over to events.stupidcancer.org. That's events.stupidcancer.org. Sign up for meetup alerts and never miss an, an event again. If you'd like to learn more about hosting your own Stupid Cancer meetup, visit stupidcancer.org slash meetup. We have events happening in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, San Diego, California, and Anchorage, Alaska. No one should face cancer alone because isolation sucks. Download Instapeer for iPhone, iPad, and Android. Create your account and instantly start chatting with someone just like you who's been there and walked in your shoes. Join our community of thousands of cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers on your phone right now. Instapeer. We've launched a newsfeed aggregator on Tom. Tumblr for all the articles, blogs, and stories we couldn't possibly have the time to post on social media. Check out what we're reading 24-7 and don't miss a beat. Subscribe at stupidcancer.org slash feed. For young adults, clinical trials are a red-hot mess, so we are throwing our hat in the ring to make some sense of the madness. Introducing I Am Not a Trial. Real young adults, real faces, and real stories plucked straight from our own community. Watch the entire video series now at IamNotAtrial.com. Support our programs and services by heading over to StupidCancerStore.org. You'll feel great and look great in your new Stupid Cancer gear. That's StupidCancerStore.org. Be proud, wear Stupid Cancer. And that is your Stupid Cancer News. All right, we got our main segment here. Maggie Chang is the president and co-founder of the Orange Giraffe Project, an organization that provides opportunities for people living with cancer to create personalized jewelry. Joining her is Stephanie Sheldon, ovarian cancer uh, survivor who went to psych- went to school for psychology and education, but has always been interested in the arts and has taken private classes over the years. In college, a holistic nursing class, as well as yoga meditation, planted the seeds for a passion in healing and nutrition and the mind-body connection. And again, someone I apparently met already, Jen Brown, young adult survivor, photographer by day at People Magazine. I'm currently, she is currently in the planning stages of a portrait project featuring cancer patients, survivors, and always collaging. I've never used that word on the air. Collaging for fun and relaxation. Please welcome to the Stupid Cancer Show, Maggie Chang, Stephanie Sheldon, and uh, I'm going to do that again. We'll cut that. You know her. <laughs> it's it's my brain. Please welcome to this. All right, please welcome to the stupid cancer show, Maggie Chang, Stephanie Sheldon, and Jen Brown. All right, it's it's back. It it fades. It comes. It's called gray matter for a reason. It's a gray area that my brain remains in my head to begin with. Anyway, we're excited. I think. Um, uh, Jackie did a great job kicking off. She's pretty much done all the PR necessary to get you guys into this segment. Um, and uh, it, it's it just speaks to how patients are really taking charge of their own lives and that we're not really depending on the system, and I'm using air quotes on the radio, that they're going to be responsible for helping us live beyond cure. 
whatever that really means. So let's start with Maggie, because this is a labor of love for you. Yes, yes, it is. And it is for all of the people who are involved. We are all volunteers. I, rarely do we get the founders or the co-founders on the, on the show. And there's always a sense of desperate peer support to meet other founders and share in the solace of, of, uh, of, of trepidation <laughs> yes. That things might actually work one day, right? And you 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 risk everything to do something. What what drew you to this, and where where did you get started? Yeah, well, we have a really lovely origin story. Um, that's uh, it was started in two thousand and seven, and I was introduced to a friend of a friend who had been diagnosed with stage four uh, cancer, and she had gone through her treatments, and so she'd lost all of her hair. Her skin color had changed, and. Uh, you know, she just really did not want to wear wigs or scarves, and she decided she would wear really bold, awesome jewelry instead. And she went shopping, couldn't find anything that expressed her, and so our mutual friend connected us because she had a vision, and I had some skills. And we like Liam Neeson skills. Like Liam Neeson. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Liam wishes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. Well played. Mic drop. Uh, jewelry making skills. Yes. And uh, he, sorry, she and I worked together to um, create this jewelry that that told her story. Jackie was talking about storytelling earlier, and that's really what this was for her. Um, the story of owning her body again, the story of transforming where she was mm-hmm. into what she could become, and her story of um, feeling beautiful on the inside, so therefore also being able to look beautiful on the outside. Right. It's, it's all the non-clinical, non-academic, non-medical right. things that we're focusing yeah, on. Exactly. And, you know, at the end of the experience, I, I thought it was really fun and it was very rewarding for me, but she really, really encouraged me to make it a thing. And she said, you know, I've taken art classes before, but there was something about getting to work with my body and decorate my body and also um, indirectly and safely use it as a part of this composition. You know, she was wearing her art and it was on her body that had changed so much. And it was a nice reintroduction to her new body. And so, anyway, she encouraged me to make it a thing, and with a lot of you made wonderful it a thing. volunteers, you made it a thing. <laughs> Where, what's your uh, background? Is it in arts and communications? Yeah, or so I'm we like a, a lawyer that quit their career. Okay. I, my mother wishes. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually a high school art teacher. Really? My, yeah, my background that is, is awesome. in art education, mm-hmm. and I've had cancer in my family. Um, I was raised by my grandparents, and they both had cancer, and so... It was in my upbringing from an early age. And Where'd I, you go to school? I, I grew up in Kansas. What? Mm. Wow. Mm. I would not have pushed that one. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Why not? <laughs> Stereotypes. Understood. Understood. <laughs> I'm very honest. I'm sorry for Brooklyn. I, I was one of a few. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I figure. I mean, there were Jews everywhere, but like no one thinks there were Jews in Kansas. There, there are probably lots of Jews in Kansas. So I knew them. <laughs> It was a small club yes, of, exactly. of the, the, the non-these people over here. Yes, and in exactly. our, our time hanging out, we learned how to make jewelry together. Perfect. True story. Yes. <laughs> Although we'd say, jewelry. So, and we'd sell it for you. So that's our people. I'm ruining this show again. That's okay. That's fine. So you, you made it your way from Kansas to New York City. Yes, with a pit stop in Philadelphia. That's All right. That's, where... a, that's a good transition, yeah. though. Thank goodness. Like, if you go from Kansas right, right. to New York, I was like, shell I shock. exploded. Yeah. Philly is a good place to... To buffer a yes, little bit. Yes, thinking is for Philly. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. No, I, this is really exciting. So tell us about your team. Yes. Oh, goodness. Um, I say that we have giant giraffe hearts because my team is such loving uh, volunteers who they they were, uh, like Jackie said, um, vo- volunteers who are also artists. And they all have full-time jobs, whether they're designers at, um, we've had designers at coach at Kate Spade at yeah you know, like real, real no you can name drop it's yeah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah you're on the show name drop all you want and uh, you know I think that they were looking to use their skills um, in a way that could be paying it forward and um, we're so lucky to work with them and to be able to work with them so consistently and um, we also have a team behind the scenes who make sure that things run smoothly and uh, like I said, I'm just so impressed that it's all volunteer and everybody works full time and and we make sure it doesn't fall apart. Well done. <laughs> I'm seriously from like founder to founder, like mm-hmm. our little peer support community here. 
like it, it's it's very impressive to look back and say it's like that scene in Back to the Future when he's like finally invented something that works. Yes, that's kind of how. Yes. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Yes, yes. So yes. let's get to Stephanie and and can I call you Steph? Sure. Okay, good. I just sure. made that up. Taking liberties on the air, but you and Jen. Both survivors, great stories. I was reading your bios here, but let's start with you because there was a lot of stuff in your bio about uh, mind body, yoga, meditation, healing, nutrition. Was that like a surprise to you to discover these things existed because you grew up in like Jersey? <laughs> I did grow up in Jersey. Really? Yeah. I pinned that one. Say, all right, forget Kansas. <laughs> I won Jersey. Wow. Um, no, you mean was I surprised that those things existed? Yeah. When do you think? No, just like you, you went you went to school. Yeah. And then it's like the enlightenment, you know, get plucked out of Jersey. I was in Staten Island. I'll talk about oh, that I was very born publicly. In Staten Island. Get out of here. Yeah. What year? Seventy four. Me too. What no. high school? <laughs> We're gonna be like related <laughs> at this point. What high school? I, I went to school in Jersey. Oh forget it. Yeah. Forget you. Yeah. All right. Tottenville High School. Class of ninety two. Oh wow. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, you, my can, you can stay. <laughs> my family's not really into nutrition. I grew up with Wonder Bread and, yeah, of course. and March Wood Promise and yeah, yeah. all that stuff and all the sugar we By could the way, eat. Promise, not a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, I went to school in Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts. Like Wesleyan or something? Um, no, the in Am the Amherst area, okay. to UMass. Oh, it's really? Okay. It's kind of like an alternatively thinking area. So. Um, I was exposed to a lot of stuff out there. And, sure. And I started doing yoga in, in my teens. And actually, my first yoga teacher was the first person to introduce me to nutrition. And she showed a video in class one day that I think Tom, one of the like Baskin and Robbins sons put out. I don't know if you heard of it. But the son of the people who founded Baskin Robbins is a big vegan, anti-dairy Guy. So the opposite of the brand, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like okay. Major rebellion in the family. Yeah. So she showed us this video and kind of started talking to us about health and the things we put in our body and all this stuff. And because yoga is about the mind body connection, sure, also. sure. And it kind of planted the seeds, probably. But it took a while before I started to really get into it because I was still eating whatever campus served you back then but i did discover God, I love campus tofu. services yeah but i love tofu naturally i used to work at ben and jerry's oh, you're the one school. that loves tofu naturally okay <laughs> i've heard i've read about you yeah i spent four years working in high school at ben and jerry's and i would come home and be psyched if my mom bought tofu for me wow which she thought was weird but like i loved it i loved ben and jerry's also but didn't yeah. one of our former employees work at like dairy queen for four years didn't maureen work at dairy queen i i can't speak for I sure, think, but think, it, that is a possibility. Like, she is from Ohio. You're triggering memories of someone telling me they worked at Derek for four years, and it has to be Maureen because I don't wouldn't be anyone else. It has to be. Yeah. <laughs> so working at Ben and Jerry's, yeah, quality. Yeah. So I'm I'm keep hearing this ice cream theme occurring. Baskin oh, really? Robbins, Ben and Jerry's, oh, huh. Tofuti. Yeah. Yeah. So I would eat tofu for fun, but okay. I still ate like Burger King back then. Of course. But like I just liked naturally all the healthy stuff. And then gradually, I can't remember. Oh, when did I start? But yet you still got cancer. I know. So that actually was extremely upsetting and yeah. shocking. I mean, I wasn't doing it to avoid cancer. Of course not. But you would think, common yeah. sense would say, you eat well, exercise. Live a good life. Don't smoke. Whatever. Yeah, I didn't. And smoke. you don't get sick. I didn't really mm -hmm. drink. My that one of my yoga teachers in college also convinced us to drop coffee, so I stopped coffee in college. Oh boy. I was like a tea drinker. I was so healthy. And yet. And yet it happened, and it was very upsetting because back then this was um, almost fourteen years ago. So I, I remember reading a book. I think at Gilda's Club in their lounge in their library about like how to prevent cancer because I was so terrified of it coming back. Mm -hmm especially in that first year. And, it, and ovarian cancer doesn't run in my family. Um, just, although, a, just a fluke. Just a fluke. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Cancer does, but not ovarian. Right. And so I was like, okay, maybe this will give me some kind of sense of reassurance that I won't have to go through this again. Right. And the whole book was about diet and nutrition. And it was which you did stuff, already. Which I had been doing for 10 yeah. years, sorry, at <laughs> least. And I, I'm not generally an angry person, but I think I threw the book across the room. Yeah. I was so frustrated. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like then there was no hope. Because right. I was like, is th if this is what they're telling you, and this is what I was doing, yes. then what is there? Right. Yeah. There was a great article in The Guardian a couple of months ago that no one liked because it basically said the truth, which is cancer is just bad luck. Yeah. 
And that bad luck can be your environment, your genetics, the air you breathe, the things you have no control over, or the fact that you may live in a, 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 a like a, an area that doesn't have a Whole Foods or a farmer's market. You know, like these are the things that you just can. There are certain choices you can make, and certain there, see. There's the laryngitis <laughs> kicking, and certain choices you emotional? can make. Yeah, <laughs> this means so much to me. Whole Foods, whole paycheck, not a sponsor. Whole Foods. So yeah, you're right. So I can only imagine that this. The, the book probably broke a couple of bricks when it was hitting the wall when you threw it. It was paperback. Oh, but... fine. Okay. <laughs> Lie to me. Tell me it was a hardcover. Yeah, I had to pay damages to Gilda's Club. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, ovarian has like no symptoms. What, yeah, what happened? Yeah. What happened? Do you mean that I ended up finding it? Yeah. It's hard. To, I mean, I actually had all the symptoms, but this was before I had a computer because that was the other thing. I had just moved to New York and where I lived, it was kind of this other way of living in a way where like cell phones weren't that common, even though they were on for a while. And it was just like a slower, it was just a different kind of way of I'm being. F- like upstate New York? No, <laughs> no, in Massachusetts where I lived before I moved to New York City. Okay. So I like didn't have a computer. I wasn't on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I was almost Amish. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I had this different and I did know something was wrong. Um, but I thought something was wrong with my stomach. So I'd gone to stomach doctors and did tests and they were mm-hmm. like, you're fine. You're fine. And then I got the whole, it's in your head or whatever they normally tell they you. They told me it was in my head too. And yeah. it was. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know a little bit about your story. <laughs> and so I kind of, I think gave up and I was pretty thin at the time, but probably had like a belly. And I remember my brother who lives in New York, um, when I first moved here, he saw me and he was like, you need to do sit-ups. And he wrote me a, a <laughs> That's a good exor- sibling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He wrote me a list of exercises to do. And, um, but something in me told me not to do it. And I'm glad that I didn't actually, cause maybe I would have, I don't know if I would have ruptured something. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did, you know, have those vague symptoms also. Sure. And then I think I was getting my period almost all the time. But I wasn't really keeping great track of it. But I remember being like, I think it's like every two weeks. Right. And I was at somebody's, I was I was with someone, and this guy was breaking up with me, actually, and I got this pain um, really bad. I had to lie down. And he was like, you need to go to the hospital or a right. doctor. And I wasn't really used to going to doctors like for something like that, you know? Yeah. So I was like, no, no, I'm fine. And then it happened again, maybe a couple of days later. And I was teaching at the time in Brooklyn out in Avenue U and the women that I worked with, cause generally it's all women in schools where they were like, oh, you should see a gynecologist cause you're bleeding a lot. Here, you know, here's my gynecologist's name. But they right. were all, I guess, like, in New York on Fridays. It was on a Friday. They, they're, they like, gone. Jews. Yeah, they're, they're gone. So I couldn't find one. And I was sort of thinking about what this guy had said. So then I thought, okay, um, I'll go. Right. So I went to NYU. I thought, oh, they're a teaching hospital. They're supposed to be, like, one of the best. And I walked in with all these symptoms, which I didn't know what it was. I was right. just sort of concerned about the bleeding. And they blew me off at first. And they're just like, oh. Don't you love that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm here with a theme here of like bedside matter. Oh, they were actually the worst. Jen, you better have a good story about bedside matter. <laughs> they were actually so bad that then like 11 or 13 hours or whatever later when they found the tumor and they said uh, it might be cancer, they said probably not like I looked really healthy and all that, I think from all the organic and whatever. And when they said it, it triggered something. I mean, I started crying. And it was probably like early hours of the morning. So right. the person who told me, said if I didn't stop crying, they were going to sedate me. What? And I couldn't cry. <laughs> I couldn't feel my feelings for years afterwards. Wow. About, it was so scary, especially wow. after being there for so long, sure. that I was afraid to emote. And that was one of the things I used to say in support groups, like, I can't cry. Right. Like, it was like a problem mm-hmm. that I had. So, yeah, bedside manner is a big... Wow. Yeah. They didn't handle that moment very well. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, That's okay. I, I pre-showed up at my bed and he had the wrong bed. So, oh really? Yeah, yeah. That's a real story. That's oh funny. God. But no, they were gonna send me home and see a gynecologist and something in me, I don't know what, was just like, Well, why don't you have one on staff? Like can't yeah. I, I don't have one. Mm-hmm. Can't you just take a look? And I I sort of fought it and then eventually they had someone look and um they did a bunch of testing and then they saw like fluid 
somewhere, and I thought it was my lungs leaking because I had a cough at the time. And I asked them if that's what it was, and they said they didn't know, and then eventually they did a CAT scan. But, but even then they said, you know, it might be cancer, but because of your age and whatever, like, it probably is You're isn't. too young for this. Yeah, yeah, kind of. And I didn't go home and, like, go on the internet and research possibilities. And, and it was a shock also because I never heard of ovarian cancer, yeah. which sounds really stupid, yeah. <laughs> but I hadn't. Yeah. And I'd gone to the gynecologist every year. I thought, like, I thought I was being really good. I went to the gynecologist every year, the dentist every six months, and I figured if anything was wrong they would find it and it was a shock to find out that they really only check the pap smears don't check for something like mm -hmm. that so i just i had no idea really what was going on and it was a shock for sure well to be continued because we have to yeah. um, get the gen I'm, I'm really i mean again like just first of all you had to be a school of visual arts because anyone yeah. that manages to get through that <laughs> is is gold in my book that's a tough school um but colon cancer is rampant in young adults it's yeah. become the fifth leading cancer up from nine to five wow. in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you may, I, I don't know if we have, we probably have a few friends in common like Vanessa Gigliotti or Michael Sapienza or any of the young adult colon groups in the city. I'll, I don't know that, I'll introduce you. I would love to meet them. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's a whole burgeoning universe called the Never yeah. Too Young Foundation. Oh, yeah. Okay. The N2Y. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been part of that yeah. uh, indiscriminately for a couple of years now, helping mm -hmm. them get together. But just to see, you know, all these young people getting, I mean, blood cancer and breast cancer are the top two cancers in young. That's mm -hmm. been consistent for 30 years. But colons, you know, it's amazing. We talk about why it's not genetics, it's environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm no scientist and I can say this anecdotally, but I can't think of any other reason why it's escalating so much because it's about what we're eating. What are we putting inside our body? Mm -hmm. So tell us your, I mean, colon cancer pretty, has pretty obvious symptoms, yeah. which you may or may not want to discuss on the air. <laughs> we know them. We've talked about them. But, you know, you're young. What was yeah. that like for you? Um, so, yeah, I kind of started, I always thought I had just like a like a weak stomach. Um, I always tried like different kind of, not diets, but thinking it was certain things like, oh, maybe it's dairy. I'll try to not, not eat so much dairy. Um Things like that. Um, but it just got so bad that I was going to doctors and I was having lots of pain. Um, but kind of like what you were saying, like no one would really take me seriously. I don't know if it was probably my age. but um, Oh, it's definitely, definitely my age. Yeah, it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah totally. Um, so I ended up going on to ZocDoc. It was really funny. And I was like, Oh, ZocDoc. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, and I found a gastroenterologist and... Uh, I just went to her and I told her my symptoms. It was funny because she's an amazing doctor. Like after she diagnosed me, um, we really connected. But she was like, okay, well, I'll do some blood work. And like how I came back like really, really, really anemic. So she gave me iron and she's like, well, we could do a colonoscopy. But like how serious do you want to be? Like how aggressive do you want to be? And I was like, um, I'd like to know, you know, if something's wrong. Um, so, yeah, I got a colonoscopy and then... Um, like that I woke up from it and she was kind of like oh we found something but like don't worry and I was like naive I didn't really think it was colon cancer it, it ended well, why up, would you I know I yeah. mean yeah you, you don't assume that um it actually ended up running in my family it was like my um grandmother's um she had two sisters and a brother that had it but I didn't know it was colon cancer because they were older and then after we found out that it was um so, yeah, that's kind of how I was diagnosed. And, and how old were you? 24. It's a great age to get colon cancer. <laughs> it's, it's a really great weird. age to get colon cancer. <laughs> yeah. That's the start of your new blog. A exactly. great age to get colon exactly. cancer. <laughs> so you're young, you're a millennial. I'm sure you were already yeah. plugged into the Internet of Universes at mm -hmm. the time. And you, you did you take to writing and blogging and journaling? Or I'm reading here, you might have gone introvert. I did introvert, yeah. yeah. It's really weird, like kind of putting yourself out there not knowing like how you want to you don't want to just be like you were saying earlier Jackie like the cancer girl you know so I didn't put it on my Facebook or anything for like a long time sure um I, like my close friends knew and um and I'm a photographer and even that was hard for me like I didn't want to take any I used to take a lot of self-portraits and do things like that and I just like didn't want anything to do with it it was weird so did you have to have an ostomy for a while or you were no, pretty good? Okay, good. Um, I had a uh, laparoscopic resection, oh, okay. which is cool. It's, it's a robot pretty much. It's so you have a, a, a nifty scar. 
yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I did six months of chemo too. ABVD? Full Fox. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, all right. So here's another young adult question that we ask yeah. of everybody here. And we mentioned this at the top with Jackie. Fertility is what makes young adult cancer unique. And, and it is a defining conversation stopper when people ask you why young adults. Were any of you read your reproductive Miranda rights before chemo started? I didn't have uh, chemo, but I told them I didn't want chemo. And the first line of attack for ovarian cancer is surgery, which sure. I had. But I, when I was calling around different people to tell them, like if, I think I had mentioned in the thing that I sent, like people back in Massachusetts, um, this one woman that I spoke to said, you know, what they tend to do for ovarian cancer is give you a hysterectomy and tell you mm -hmm. afterwards. Right. And I didn't know that. And I'm so grateful that she told me that. That's so, rare that you're given that in, in advance. Well, my friend yeah, you're like, told yeah. me that yeah. the doctors didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. So, and my whole life was really about having children. Sure. Before, that's why I went into education. Like so many decisions I made in my life were about preparing to be like the best mother and the healthiest. That's part of actually why I got into nutrition was I thought then I could have this super healthy baby growing in my healthy body. Yes. And so I was not, there was the shock of the cancer and then the shock of like, wow, I might not be able to have children. Right. And, but um, you brought that to the table. What do you mean? Like you came prepared to have that conversation. Well, I didn't really have a conversation. No one was really talking about it. So what I did before the surgery, you have to sign on this paperwork. Right. And I wrote on there that they did not have permission to take uh, out both ovaries or anything that would interfere with my fertility. And at, I didn't even want them to remove my one ovary if possible. I was wanting them just to take the tumor out. Right. Um, but I would, if they had to take maybe one and the person there was like fighting with me about it and telling me I was crazy and sure. stupid mm -hmm. and putting my life at risk, which is very confusing. Cause they told me before it probably isn't cancer cause of my age. So I was like, it's probably why, like, why right. are you saying this? Mm -hmm. And also having not been through major surgery, I was just like, well, if it is that I'll just have another surgery. Right. And so, but they did respect my wishes. So I had my, I maintained my fertility. Okay. Jen? Um, my doctors had asked if I wanted to get, have um, eggs frozen. Um, they did? They did. But they oh, gave finally. Me, they gave me like a week oh, to decide. Oh, well, only a week. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and my now. insurance didn't cover it <laughs> no, at of all. Course. So I decided not to because, I don't know, I was just overwhelmed. And I, that was like, the. it was always like I would love to have kids. And my doctor was like, I had a patient who had a baby after your chemo at 35. So I was like, okay, I don't. I don't know if I can. I mean, I, I'm assuming maybe I, I haven't tried. Yeah, it's a huge yeah. uphill battle in our yeah. universe fighting for uh, insurance parity yeah. to cover the costs, which can be anywhere from eight mm -hmm. to $16,000 wow. um, just to harvest oocytes and follicles. Or if you're married, to create embryos and freeze them. They're working on tech now, which is like science fiction, where they can just scrape ovarian tissue before your chemo starts and mm -hmm. freeze that. Then they wow. implant the ovarian tissue back in your body when you're well, and it becomes follicles. Wow, amazing! That's like fifty grand right now, and like <laughs> oh only like in like Aruba or some some crazy <laughs> Caribbean island. But that's the tech that they're working on now. So if it becomes a mandate, where any woman, like the breast cancer thing, any woman dies with breast cancer gets free reconstruction for life because that's called um what's it called um oh damn words uh can't remember it. <laughs> there's there's a, a term for how physicians have to do harm to do good. Mm. So they have mm. to remove your breast to save your life. They're violating the Hippocratic Oath. So the best that we can do as a moral society is to guarantee you this level of quality post violation of Hippocratic Oath. How can you conflate that in, the, in a good way with you have the right to be a mom? It's your liberty to be a mom one day, cancer shouldn't take that away from you. And the fact that you can't afford to preserve is not your responsibility. That's I, a really good point. Yeah. Iatrogenics. That's what it's called. It's a fancy word. <laughs> Iatrogenics. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it's Googleable. Right? It's very Googleable. <laughs> Iatrogenics. But that does remind me, I, I, I forgot at first, but after my surgery, my doctor was pushing for me to freeze my eggs, which surprised me. And we, I didn't even think about the cost. Mm -hmm. But she just said, or, or if I wasn't going to get pregnant, which right. she wanted me to do. like So fertility actually came up after the fact. 
Which of is like, you know, yeah. before you die, yeah. you should make having a child <laughs> yeah. your priority. Mm-hmm. And that kind of surprised me. I don't know if anyone else was told they should have a baby ASAP. Well, I want to connect. We have <laughs> yeah, a, a, a I, one of my dear friends, sorry, is, is had ovarian cancer, but she had a hysterectomy on the operating table and didn't tell her anything. She woke mm-hmm. up, no baby. Mm-hmm. You know, she finally That's went through surrogacy oh, and they're a beautiful boy now who's four through the husband's sperm and a donor egg. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's that's what we're trying to eliminate. Yeah, that should be illegal. Yes, I it think. should. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a major thing to just take away from someone without their consent. Yeah. Right. So, Jen, uh, mm-hmm. you're you're well now. So, where are it's you now? Been, yeah, I'm three years. Yeah, I'm in remission. So that's good. Yeah, congrats. We Yay. like that. <laughs> and you yeah. are you are obviously de introverted. <laughs> Coming on the show to millions know, of people I here. Know, know. We've <laughs> uninterverted you. No, I think it, it helps and it's good to talk about it. I think when I was going through it, maybe I was just like in shock. Sure. But it it's good after effect. And I wish I talked about it more. Well, I, th- I this did. goes back to how what, what I love about what stupid cancer has become mm-hmm. and represents people. It's it's not just like we're giving you permission to be pissed. Like you said, we're, we're really I'm fine. And 20 years later, but I'm still pissed. <laughs> but we give you a channel to help someone just like you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So specifically with young adults and colon cancer, it's it's being taken seriously. Yeah. It's being connected to the right people right away. And if you want to be an introvert, that's fine. But you have the right to know there's all this stuff available. Mm-hmm. Like Orange Giraffe. There you go. Let's bring it full yeah. circle. Yeah, sure, Tell sure. us how you guys plugged into uh, to Maggie's universe. <laughs> I, I was taking classes at the Creative Center and I saw it and had a good feeling about it and signed up and loved it. It was probably in the f- almost 14 years I've been taking classes. They're the best class I've ever taken. You're not just saying that because you're and sitting next to you. No, <laughs> I've, to- I've told other people that too. Um, Thank you. It just was mind blowing. The whole uh, aspect with the collab, uh, having the collaboration. That's something that was new that I hadn't experienced before and was so exciting and I think there's something about two minds coming together mm-hmm. to work on something. And it was also so personal and uh, just the whole process. Like Maggie puts so much into what she does. Seriously, um, that's I love the Creative Center, but a lot of times, sometimes the teachers kind of just sometimes they eat their dinner or they're not really paying attention to us. Whereas Maggie has us through this whole big process. She's starving the whole way through. <laughs> she really is. <laughs> because she really is. Everybody. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like the, she really knows how to plan something and bring something out and just, and then when I did it also, there was this beautiful presentation on the last day where um, we were given our necklaces in a box and mm. Um, someone, I don't know if it was Maggie or someone behind the scenes had put together a booklet of like the artists. Yeah, or, our team did that. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was just an so, artist catalog. Yeah, yeah, like I just felt so respected and inspired and empowered and, and excited all at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I learned so much, mm-hmm. not only about making jewelry, because I've taken other jewelry making classes, but just the whole idea of a vision board, which Maggie does mm-hmm. in the beginning. Right. I'd never done that before or heard of it. And so that I don't look at, I don't want to throw out my old magazines now, which is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I keep saying when someone's like, you got to throw them out. I'm like, no, yeah. there's, I, I could do something with them. But I don't know. It just, it was really a life changing class. It was really amazing. Well, thank you. And Jen, I, sure. Jen came from the world of arts and communications yeah. and visual. Mm-hmm. And then you had this introversion experience <laughs> and, and art probably took on a whole new meaning for you. And then you discovered this. Can you talk us? We have about five minutes yeah. left for the way. For so the actually, I think I saw how it came across to me it was through a Creative Center email. That's how I originally saw it. So we it. need to get Robin on the show. Yeah. Clearly <laughs> now. We love Robin. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. But um, I first took the class with Maggie at the Museum of Art and Design. Um, Another one of our partners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was really awesome. And I really liked the um, aspect of go- walking through the museum. And we talk about art and then kind of learn and then put those learnings into work and making things with our hands. I think that's the most important thing for me because... Like being, it was nice to do something where you didn't have to think about it as much, like in like a super artistic way, and put meaning to it. You just kind of work. You let it throw like flow through your fingers, and I think that was really important. And it was it. I had never made jewelry before, so it was really interesting to me, and I really enjoyed it. 
And I it thought was it was very really relaxing. nurturing. Exactly. Having somebody yeah. else working with you mm-hmm. who was so supportive yeah. and really able to get where you were coming from. Mm-hmm. Like, it was this incredible kind of emotional support yeah, in a totally. way, right? Yeah. yeah. There was something about that. Yeah, and you can connect with another person yeah. at the same time, which is really awesome. Amazing. Yeah. yeah was collaboration. it called a board? I forget what it's called, that first thing. Yeah, vision did. board, oh, inspiration okay. board. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I like that you're picking up on the word collaboration because it's yeah. definitely one of our values. And yeah. when we talk about personalized jewelry making, we really do want to make it personal. And sometimes it's... It's scary to go out there and take a class and mingle with other people who also have cancer and you think you might get into a room and that's what you're going to be talking about. But Mm -hmm. nope, we're going to be making art. Yeah. (laughs) And honestly, um, sometimes you just want a little bit of undivided attention. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we love that two people can come together and create something that neither one would have created on their own. And um, a lot of friendships have come out of that. And it, it, I think that the, the support comes through the art making as well as the human interaction and just mm-hmm. bonding over um, the human experience. Because yeah, everybody's yeah. lives have been touched by cancer. Mm-hmm. Volunteers um, have stories too, and yeah, and it's it's a experience that we do together. Sure. I think the people that you chose. I don't know if you turn people away, but I've noticed that the people <laughs> that you have are just so warm and. She talented. filters. She definitely filters. <laughs> really? I don't know if you There's a vetting <laughs> process. <laughs> Yes, there's a question. <laughs> Mal, you had a question? I did. Actually, it was based off a statement that you had made before, Stephanie, that we were, when we were talking prior to the show about how you, meditation doesn't oh, have right. the same effect as participating in jewelry making and art making. And I'm, I'm curious if you could sort of explain that. Oh, okay. Well, maybe I was... So I found... I mean, I think meditation has amazing benefits, so I didn't mean to say that. But I had found, even after years of meditation prior to my cancer, that just after the fact, it was very challenging for me to just sit and do it. Maybe because of being trying to do it alone or maybe just the internal stuff, you know, just there were so many emotions. And making art, especially with the Orange Draft Project, but you're just, you're so focused and so in the moment, which is like a meditation because you're you're not thinking about anything else. It's actually even easier than meditation where you're maybe fighting other thoughts that drift in. And so it, you you just leave so energized and you're so energized in it and, and you're so like connected. So I just think it's an incredibly empowering uh, meditation that's easier, I think, for most people to do than maybe like the classic kind that people think about like following your breath or having a mantra or anything like that Does well that unfortunately we, ha- we have to wrap the show we're over we can clearly talk for weeks at a time <laughs> but i want to give maggie the star of the show here you you, you oh, invented no, no, something no, we're all stars you really, invented really. Our, the founder no. star how's that okay own it <laughs> own it trust me it's hard to own you invented something that works you're mm-hmm. changing people's lives mm. you're making a difference yeah and they're changing ours too See, oh, she always goes no, back to. Not, we're true. not allowed to have humility here on the stupid cancer show. Collaboration, collaboration. <laughs> Own it. Take pride. Okay. You, you did something really good. What is your hope for Orange Draft Project? Mm, great question. Pretend I'm a big donor. <laughs> 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 I said pretend. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned something at the start of the show that it's not just about the cure. It's really about healing. Mm-hmm. And um, we think that creativity has so much to do with that. And if we can get people to understand that if you're making art, you're also um, finding your identity and your voice. You're finding some stress relief. Um, you're able to express some really complicated emotions and experiences that you've lived through uh, in a symbolic way and in a tangible way and that um, healing can come in so many different forms but being creative and doing something nice for your body like making jewelry for it can be a really great move well i can't thank you guys enough this is a really really great show maggie chang president and co-founder of the Orange Giraffe Project, an organization that provides opportunities for people living with cancer to create personalized jewelry, joined by Jen Brown and Stephanie Sheldon, young adult survivors extraordinaire, equally angry as I am. That's your new hashtag for the night, survivors extraordinaire. Thank you so much for making this a really great show. I'd also love to mention 
Final shout out. Possible final shout out to all of our volunteers and all of our yes. partners. But we're also currently looking for more volunteers and partners. We're very open. A website. Yeah, www.orangedraftproject.org. There you go. And then you can find the secret behind why it's called Orange Draft Project. I know why. <laughs> did you look at the website? I did. Yeah, check yeah. it out. I already did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that's time for our closing sequence. Prepare to activate. Uh, I hear there's rumors on the uh, internets. Have you ever seen a grown man naked? And so, to all of you, a fond farewell. Hooray, I'm helping. You are a meathead. Oh, Magoo, you've done it again. That was so terrible, I think you gave me cancer. Okay, folks, that's our show. The 375th episode of The Stupid Cancer Show. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and following us on SoundCloud. I'd like to thank our guests, Jackie Duvall Smith, Maggie Chang, Stephanie Sheldon, and Jen Brown. Broadcasting since 2007, The Stupid Cancer Show is a production of Stupid Cancer, the largest charity comprehensively addressing young adult cancer online at stupidcancer.org. Coming to you from the chemo deck and on behalf of my team here, well, Mallory is my team here tonight at The Stupid Cancer Show. We hope you had as much fun as we did poking a stick at Stupid Cancer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here next week on the next exciting podcast of the Stupid Cancer Show. Goodbye, folks.